Today, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is I wanted to steal a page from um, the Second Year Bible School and just give you a foretaste a little bit, but more so because I feel how important this subject is. This is, in fact, um, first and se second sessions of the uh, first module of Second Year. So we wanted to uh, we want to look at who God is and what He is like, don't you? There is, in fact, a whole entire study in the study of theology and systematic theology called Theology Proper, Theology Proper, which concerns itself exclusively with a study of God Himself. There are studies called Demonology, which exclusively considers itself, concerns itself with studying the demonic then there's eschatology, which exclusively studies the end times. But today, what I want to do is just introduce what second years would do thoroughly, by the way. There are 28 different attributes of God, but they will study many of those. Today, we want to look at three, uh, three of those attributes of God, because your first, your most predominant thought about who God is and what he is like is the most determining factor of your life. Nothing determines your life more than who you believe he is, or if you believe that he is not. Your most dominant thought about who God is and what he is like, and that he is or that he is not, that thought right there determines how you live, how you marry, how you raise kids. It determines what you hope for. It determines what you, how you view the world. It determines everything about your life. It touches everything regarding you, how you sleep at night and why you wake up in the morning. Very important for us to look at this idea here of theology proper. Strangely enough, this is not frequently taught in churches because I guess one of the reasons is it comes across a little bit more like a lecture. You know, So you would probably feel like you're in college a little bit but another reason I think as to why churches don't teach this often is because I assume, since it's exclusively about God, um, what he is like and who he is, as opposed to what he can give me. People in general want, are more interested in what God can do for them and what God can give them than what they are in who he is. And so I think that that's why it sometimes falls on deaf ears and dead hearts, empty heads, like, ah, I care about what can I have? <laughs> what can he do for me? Because right now I'm struggling. However, I realize a couple of things regarding doctrine, and I want you to understand the same thing and grasp this. But to understand doctrine is important, if not most important next to knowing who God is. But knowing who God is is, in fact, the doctrine. For instance, God works in you through doctrine. Like a, a, a doctor or a surgeon will take a scalpel, he'll take that knife, and he'll dig in deep and he'll take a growth out. So he has to cut you. So the very, the very thing that can heal you also can kill you. So doctrine does that. It, it, it divides, but that's why it divides, because some are healed by it, others are offended by it, and they hate God for it. But doctrine is, is God's scalpel. Doctrine is God's knife, that he goes in there and he removes the cancer. He removes the ulcer. He removes the growth. He cuts things away. Just like a, an artist will stand in front of a block of granite, and in order to get, what's the most famous statue? What is that? All right. Michelangelo. Okay, David. All right. Do you realize before David's standing there right now, as perfectly as he's been sculpted, it used to be just a block of stone. And what needed to happen was not that he had to bring out David. He had to cut away what David wasn't. He had to chisel away at that block and cut away everything that shouldn't be attached to David in order to have David show up. Same way, doctrine oftentimes does that. Doctrine is what matures me spiritually. It's what turns me into a mature individual. I just spoke to the elders in training this morning and I said to them, no one ever matured spiritually outside of the truth of Scripture. 
If I can't, if scripture can't help you, I can't help you. Somebody says, man, he's a powerful pastor. Well, the only thing that could possibly make him powerful or a good shepherd or a good elder is the fact that he gives him the word. Because if this scripture can't help you, trust me, I can't. <laughs> if this scripture can't lead you, I can't lead you. If this verse can't impact you, I can't impact you. So doctrine is, in fact, what matures the person spiritually. You cannot grow any more mature than the doctrine you know. Hands down. Impossible to grow beyond your understanding of Scripture and doctrine. Doctrine confronts my personal deception. I'm only deceived up until the point where I understand the doctrine clearly. I'm no longer deceived. Now I become willing or unwilling to obey it or to give myself to it or submit to it. But doctrine removes the cobwebs of deception. Doctrine points out the lies I tend to believe about God. It chisels away at those lies. It chisels away at the lies that I believe about myself, what I believe about the meaning of life, what I believe about eternity. Doctrine chisels all of that stuff away, all of the lies, all of the cobwebs, and all of the stone and the rock and the granite that needs to be removed in order for that statue to be perfectly mature. Doctrine, in fact, flips the light switch on and reveals all my ignorance. It's lovely. <laughs> the more you know about Scripture, the more you realize how little you do know. The more you realize who God is, the, le the more you realize how little you knew about who He was. We are going to be studying God throughout all eternity. The angels in heaven don't fall down and, 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 and declare holy, holy, holy to the superlative degree, holy, holier, holiest. They don't declare that only one time. They don't, they don't stop declaring it because they keep on learning more things about just how holy he is. Doctrine lays down tracks I can set my life on. Gives me guidance. Doctrine helps me understand who I am in light of who God is. Doctrine creates a framework for meaning of life and eternal outcomes. Doctrine helps me hear God say what he means to say, not what I want him to say. If you're low on doctrine, it's because you're immature. There's no other way to grow. Because of this, what I want to do is, I do want to treat you like I know you are, hungry for God, desiring to know him more and understand him better. So as I know that is who you are, I'll treat you that way. And we will talk about some of the doctrines about God, theology proper, the doctrine of God. So let's start by just asking three questions. Number one, when you close your eyes in your worship, what do you visualize? You're standing there, you're singing to God, I worship you, Lord. What are you visualizing? When you pray with your eyes closed, Lord, I just pray and I thank you. Like, who do you imagine him to be like? What are you thinking? What are you visualizing? What are you seeing? When you consider God, what image do you have of him in your mind? The fact is, you cannot be wrong about God, who he is and what he's like, and be right about life. In every single place that you are wrong about God, you are wrong about life, meaning, and eternity. You are wrong about purpose, and you're wrong about your future. Every single time you misunderstand God, you misunderstand why you are here. The only possible way to be right about life is to be right about God, the one who gave you life and called you to it. So your most dominant thought, as I mentioned, about God is, and what He's like is, in fact the most determining factor in your life and the most determining factor of your eternity. You cannot, you cannot have an incorrect dominant thought about God and have eternity all at the same time. In other words, you can't be a Muslim and be right about eternity. Job 22 verse 21 says, Now acquaint yourself with him. Now acquaint yourself with him. In other words, get familiar with him. Become familiar. Become, Start understanding him. Learn about him. Wrap your mind around who he is and what he's like. 
and how he acts and what's his means of grace and his way of doing things. Learn these things about God. That's what it says in Job chapter 22, verse 21. Because then it says, thereby good will come to you. Your understanding of God is the means through which good comes to you. Your understanding of who he is, what he's like, how he operates, is the avenue or the conduit through which good comes to you. Your ignorance of God brings nothing good to you. It only brings deception and lies to you. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24a says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But, check this out, Let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That's the only thing you ever allowed to boast about. God, I just saw something beautiful about you, God. That is something that you need to glory in. Watch this verse, Daniel eleven thirty-two. I'm showing you verses regarding what it means or what happens when you get to know him and understand him. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, it says, But the people who know their God, theology proper, the doctrine of God, the study of God, those who know their God shall be what? Strong. And do what? Carry out great exploits. Those who know their God, they no longer hesitate. They jump in and do great things. They do it, they take action, another translation says. And they do so with strength. A.W. Pink said, An unknown God can neither be trusted, served, nor worship. An unknown God can neither be trusted, served, nor worshipped. This is why you will see when it comes to shallow Christianity, you will find that most, most people who walk away from the faith, what do they call it now? They, when, they, when they give up their faith, what do they call it? Deconstruct. Oh, it's such a nice word. They deconstruct. They sound intelligent. They deconstruct their faith. Those people are people who literally lived around the shallow end of Christianity and then they walk away. They don't know their God. So one of the very first ways we can describe God before we look at his attributes is the fact that he is a supreme being. He is a, he's a being, but he's the supreme being. We are human beings. He is a supreme being. So let's consider some of the ways which God is different from us. Like I mentioned, we are human beings. He's the supreme being. We are temporal beings. He is the eternal being. We are finite beings. He is the infinite being. We are fleshly beings. He is a spirit being. We are mutable beings, always changing, always growing, always aging, always learning. He, however, on the other hand, he is an immutable being, which means he never mutates, he never changes, he never alters, he never repents as we do. For instance, you say, ah, Jacques, I know I saw a scripture that says, and he repented for making man. Let me just ask you this. Has God ever sinned? No, he's holy. What's he repenting from if he's made a mistake? He doesn't repent like you and I repent. We repent from our sins. He has never sinned. But let's not talk about that today. My point is that we, are, we mutate, we change. Every morning you wake up with a different attitude. It's like, wait a minute, what happened to my wife? And then you go like, no, it was me. <laughs> We change, we alter, we grow, we learn. God doesn't. For instance, God cannot age. Why not? Because he's not subject to time. Time is subject to him. God cannot become more loving. Neither can God improve in anything he's ever done. Because if he did, then there would have been a time where he wasn't supreme in any and all of those qualities. If he's most perfect and he becomes better, it means 
He wasn't most perfect before he became better. You see, God cannot learn anything. You, you're not surprising him by what you decided to do. He's not shocked. He's not surprised because he cannot learn anything. Because if he did learn something, then there would have been a time he would not have had omniscience. He is omniscient. He knows it all. He knows everything. There's nothing hidden from him. Therefore, he cannot learn. Because if he learned, it meant that he first didn't know it. But now he knows it. We are thinking beings. We are, as humans, we are reasoning beings. We are calculated beings. We add things up. While scripture says, on the other hand, as high as the heaven is from the earth, so much higher are his thoughts than ours. We are fallen beings. He, however, is holy. What does it mean? It means that he's altogether different from us. It means that he is morally perfect. He's perfectly pure, perfectly righteous, perfectly true, perfectly just, perfectly holy, perfectly perfect. So, now that I've set up who God is, let's talk about his attributes, which is his nature, his character, things that are true about him. And I wanted to share three of them with you. There are, however, 28 different attributes. I'm just taking one page from our uh, second session of second, our first module in second year. So the first thing we've got to know about God is that is that he is incomprehensibly, or let me say, it's called the incomprehensibility of God. It is just one degree too cold in here. Thank you. Thank you. And especially the third. The incomprehensibility of God is the first thing we have to know about him. Can anybody say the incomprehensibility of God? The incomprehensibility of God. He cannot be comprehended. This does not mean that, that we have no way of knowing anything about God. It means that no human mind can comprehend all that God is in a comprehensive sense. It's very important to understand because every single doctrine is God's scalpel digging into you and taking something out. Every single doctrine is important for you to understand because it is Michelangelo's chisel, you know, that he's taken away stuff from you that you ought to not have on you. God is maturing you with every single doctrine that he's teaching us. So let's think about this incomprehensibility of God. It means that no human mind can comprehend all of who he is in a comprehensive way. God always transcends our most highest and loftiest thoughts we can possibly have about him. For instance, if you can imagine him to be the most powerful God imaginable, guess what? He is infinitely more powerful than what you can imagine him to be. If in fact, you can imagine him to be the most loving God imaginable. The truth is, he is infinitely more loving than you can possibly imagine him to be. If you can imagine him to be holy to the superlative degree, or we have not scratched the surface of how holy God truly is. This is the incomprehensibility of God. Right in this doctrine right here, the world, make they make big mistakes. People walk away from their faith because I just, I remember Oprah saying this, that she was sitting in the back of a church and the pastor was preaching that God is jealous. And she said, that's it. I can't worship a jealous God. Have, has anybody seen her give that testimony? That's when she walked away from the church. Well, the reason is, and her, she's just one. The reason is that people don't understand just how small their brains and thoughts are, how low their thoughts are, and how, how high God's are. He's infinitely greater than our human minds can comprehend. So you might ask, okay, well, why is this important to know? What does this doctrine do for me? It does a lot, but let me just scratch the surface. Without grasping this doctrine of the incomprehensibility of God, we are in danger of making God only as big, only as powerful, only as merciful, only as majestic as we can imagine him to be. And guess what? 
we would be preaching a God who is only as big as we can make him, which is, again, not the, not the God of the Bible. Again, we are determining the size of God. We are determining how big he is and how much he can do. It's called idol worship. We don't make him. We just know him in part and we, and we realize that there's so much more beyond it. That's why you can read a scripture and that's why you can hold two, two, two um, seemingly contradictory thoughts together. For instance, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. We go like, well, that's, that's nonsense. No, it's not. The Bible teaches both. Yeah, but then how do you make sense of it? You don't have to. I love how MacArthur actually explains it. He says, um, who wrote the book of Romans? Anybody? Who wrote the book of Romans? Who? Okay, there's one. We got one. Paul. Anybody else? Who? God. The Holy Spirit. Who wrote the book of Romans? Paul or God? God. God. <laughs> okay. So, again, what we have is we have, you know, there are so many different examples of that where you cannot. Who lives your Christian life? You do? Oh, you. Oh, so you living your life pleasing toward the Lord. Or do we live and move and have our being? I don't know. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives. Who's living your Christian life? Christ. No, but I thought you are supposed to. Yeah, both. <laughs> see, see, Christianity uh, brings you to a place where, where you say, God, you, your thoughts are much higher than what I can, I can grasp. It's the incomprehensibility of God. And if we do not wrap our minds around this, then we will run into walls over other things. And we will create a God only as big as, as only big enough to fit within my little brain. That's God. Well, that's an idol because he's, my God's much bigger than the God you can come up with and imagine. This is in fact a humbling doctrine because the person who denies this doctrine does not know how ignorant he really is of the God we serve. This doctrine drives pride from us. Why? Because it teaches us that we are limited in our understanding. We have to approach Scripture knowing that I can't argue that. And I, I have to come humbly in search of who God truly is. This, this is the incomprehensibility of God. He is much greater than you can imagine him. Second attribute of God that we want to talk about here today is the simplicity of God. The simplicity of God. This does not mean that God is simple uh, in his understanding. This does not mean that it's simple, it's easy for us to understand him. What we mean by saying that God is simple is that God is not a composite being. Uh, he is not made up of multiple different things altogether. That's not how we exist. God is, in fact, a simple being, not a complex being. God is, in fact, one. He's not fractured. He is not 5% love, 4% justice, 10% grace, 99% mercy. He's, he's not like that. No, he is 100% of every single attribute that he has. He doesn't have an attribute. He is that attribute. For instance... God doesn't love. The Bible says that he is love. He doesn't have it. He is it. The Bible doesn't say that he, that he has mercy. It says that he is merciful. He is that. He is that altogether. Every single part of God is connected and fully part of every other part of God. For instance, God is love, like I mentioned, and God is just, meaning that his love is just, and his justice is love, altogether. Uh, this doctrine is sometimes a little bit complicated, but it's very important because I'll show you 
what the benefit is for understanding this. Every one of God's attributes are eternally connected, like I mentioned. Think about um, the holiness of God. The holiness of God. Every other attribute of God is marked by this one attribute called the holiness of God. For instance, the love of God is holy love. There is nothing unholy about the way God loves. When you see God loving Jacob, but not Esau, that's holy love. There's nothing unholy about that. His power is holy power. There is never a moment where his power supports anything evil. He washes away the whole entire world with the exception of Noah and his children and his family. Yet, that powerful expression of God was in fact holy power. There's nothing evil about it. His wrath is holy wrath. There's nothing evil or unholy about his wrath. There is nothing unjust about his wrath. There's nothing unfair about his wrath. His wrath is only his wrath on any one person is 100% deserved, 100% justified. He's holy. No matter what he decides, no matter what he does. No matter what he does what he decides not to do. Perfectly holy. So why is it important for you and I to understand the doctrine of the simplicity of God? Well, because plainly stated, the person who is unaware of the simplicity of God, that he is one, and that every one of his attributes hang on every other attribute, Anybody who does not understand the simplicity of God could go ahead and preach only the parts of God that they want to be true of Him. This happens all the time. For instance, some people do not want to hear anything about God calling them to repentance. All they want to hear is God's affirmation of their forgiveness. So they choose churches that only do that. When in fact God says, wait a minute. This is how that is expressed in you preaching that without this first. (laughs) You're like, you want to preach love without truth. But the my kind of love hangs on truth. My love is truth. And my truth is loving. It's 100% the same. To preach that God is love, 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 but never present Him as the God whose love is just, whose love is holy, whose love is righteous, whose love is true, presents a false God. And why, did, why is it so easy for people to do that? Is because they don't understand the simplicity of God. You think you're running into the arms of the, the, the loving arms of God when in fact you're running into truth. And that's not always easy. That's not always nice. Salvation Army, uh, their founder, William Booth, he pointed out the collateral damage that would come to the body of Christ for missing this doctrine. And the future false gospel that will spring from the misunderstanding of the fact that God is one. That we serve and worship a simple God. The simplicity of God. That is not a compound being. It's almost like, you know, when you take a granite tabletop, countertop in the kitchen, and you cut through it. If, wherever you get to, it's granite. But if you go to a cheap one, you know, that has, that has, uh, looks like granite, they lay something on top of it that looks like granite, but anything below it is just cheap wood, right? You cut through that thing, a half an inch deep, boom, you hit wood. It's not the same. Well, God is the same throughout. His justice is holy. His justice is loving. His justice is Filled with wrath. His justice is merciful. His justice is all of the above. But so is it true for every other attribute of God. So he said, this is William Booth, when he spoke of the future church and the collateral damage that will come from not understanding that God is one, Old Testament, New Testament, he said this, quote, the chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without a Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, 
Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Heaven without hell. R.C. Sproul said something along the very same lines over the same issue. He says, A God who is all love, all grace, all mercy, no sovereignty, no justice, no holiness, and no wrath is an idol. And unfortunately, it's become Christianity. So we have to understand that God is simple. Doesn't change because he loves. How many of you have ever seen somebody make a statement about the truth of God and then somebody else says, yeah, but God, but God is love. As if love overrides justice. It doesn't. Yeah, but God forgives. As if forgiveness overrides God's truth. It doesn't. So that's the simplicity of God. So we looked at the incomprehensibility of God. God is way beyond what you can imagine in your mind for him to be. We also saw now, yeah, God is simple. And then thirdly, I would like to touch on and finish with the fact that God is spirit. God is spirit. In John 4, 19 and 24, it says, Then the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Who is this? This is a Samaritan woman. And we talked about her last week. And uh, she was at the well. Jesus came to the well. Jesus was a Jewish male. They don't usually talk, but Jesus was talking to her. And then Jesus says to her, you've had five husbands and the one that you're currently with, you're not even married to. And she says this, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain where you are standing. And you Jews say that Jerusalem over there, that mountain there is where you ought to be worshipping God. Jesus said to a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what uh, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Watch this. For the Father seeks such to worship him. And then he says, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus was in fact telling this woman at the well that God doesn't need to be worshipped in a specific geography. They used, to, they used to ascend a mountain to worship God. Have you ever noticed? And God would meet people on mountains. Notice that? Mountain is made out of what? Rock. And last week we determined and we concluded that your worship is acceptable to God, even though God has a tremendously high standard for how to worship Him and who's allowed to worship Him and when they're supposed to worship Him and what they're supposed to wear when they worship Him and how the altar is supposed to be built. I mean, remember, and, and what's supposed to be brought as a sacrifice. I mean, He has all of these, these rules and regulations and these high standards. Otherwise, He would reject their worship. So how do we know God's going to accept our worship? Because we're on the rock. That's why. We're on the rock. Now they had to ascend, at a, ascend a mountain in order to go and worship God. And she's saying, we worship God on this mountain. However, you Jews, you worship him on that mountain. And Jesus says, no. The time is and already the time's coming and already is here when you will worship him in spirit. Why? Because he is spirit. Alright? He is spirit, and you will worship him in spirit and in truth. Whose truth? Jesus. You will stand upon the rock, Jesus, and worship him, and your worship will be accepted because of it. So the idea that God is spirit means that he has no physical substance. When you close your eyes to worship God, or you go on your knees, you close your eyes to pray, you are visualizing, imagining something, something, someone. Yet, the Bible says he's spirit. In other words, he has no substance. But sometimes people go like, if you ask them, well, what does God look like? They'll say, well, he looks like smoke. Well, smoke is made of particles. That's substance. They say, well, he's, he's fog. Well, again, fog is substance. Well, he's, he's steam. It's like, a, it's like a steam cloud. No, no, it's, that's substance. He has no substance. There is, God is a spirit. 
Do you realize you too are a spirit? And you can't draw that picture. If I just say to you, here's a blank piece of paper, draw me your spirit. What would you draw? Because your spirit is made up out of the Bible exchange or interchanges the word spirit and heart, right? Whenever you see a heart, you can put spirit or you can put conscience or you can put desire or you can put thought. That's your spirit. Can you draw that? Can you draw conscience? Can you draw heart? Can you draw thoughts? Can you draw impulses? Convictions? No, you can't. Because that is the spirit. And now when you say body, I know we're going to draw body. And we made in the image and likeness of God. And he's over there. He's this big, big, big God. No, he's spirit. Like you are spirit. You're made in his image and in his likeness. Consider these verses. Colossians 1.15. We're talking about who the Bible says God is and what he's like. In Colossians 1.15, it says he is the image of the invisible God. No, there's image. He is the image of the invisible God. Invisible. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God is spirit. He has no substance. And he cannot be seen. He is invisible. People then wonder, well, if, if he is, that's kind of strange because Moses saw the face of God. The Bible talks about scriptures referring to God having hands, God having an ear in Isaiah 59 verse 1. It talks about God having eyes in 2 Chronicles 16 9. It speaks of God having a mouth in Matthew 4 4. It speaks of God having an arm or arms in Deuteronomy 33 verse 27. Well, then he has eyes, he has a mouth, he has an arm, he has a hand, he has a, you know, ear. The Bible says he does. Then what does it look like? Well, here you go again. You see, there's a contradiction. The Bible says he's invisible, but the Bible says he has hands. And So what do we make of the fact that the Bible refers to his body as being a human body? You see, when the Bible speaks of God in human terms, don't lose this, don't miss this. When God speaks, or when the Bible speaks of God in human terms, we must realize that Scripture is using a certain figure of speech called anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. You don't need to be able to say that word, write it, or remember it. All right? Anthropomorphism, as a matter of fact, this figure of speech that the Bible uses pretty often is a way of describing God, describing what He does, by, by attributing to him human features. This is in order for us to better understand certain truths about him. So we can understand him better. Somebody says, well, Jacques, no. Now you're making things up. <laughs> we are created exactly to look as God does in his image and his likeness. He has a shape of a human body. Well, don't forget the Bible also says that God has wings and his feathers covers his children. Is he a bird? No. Why? Because the Bible uses anthropomorphism. We understand what it looks like when a bird covers her chicks with her wings and her feathers. So we understand. We got that picture and God says, I'm doing this. Anthropomorphism. Attributing to God certain certain attributes, human attributes, in order to understand a God of spirit, the God that is spirit and spirit alone. Let's consider the meaning of these human features the Bible attributes to God. It says in Isaiah 59, verse 1, look at this verse, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Okay, so what do we do with that? Well, we understand what God is telling us a hand does. His hand here saves. So God's hand here teaches us that God can take a hold of you. 
that God can resist the wicked, that God can lift somebody up from the quagmire, that God can crush the wicked, that God can give to you the hand of God. Anthropomorphism. He's teaching you something about what God does by showing you the certain human trait. What about God's ear? Well, that teaches us that God can hear us cry. He hears our prayer. He hears our complaints. He hears those who bless him. He hears those who curse him. Then in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So here we have the idea that God has eyes. All right. Well, what does God's eyes teach us? What is what, what can we learn from the fact that God has eyes? Well, God's eyes teaches us that God is aware of everything he sees. Nothing escapes his sight, his view. He sees not like men do, the Bible says. Men look on the outside, but God looks at the heart. He has eyes. God is aware. I don't have the verse here, but since I'm thinking about it, let me say that what about the face of God? What about the face of God? Well, the face of God is literally referring to intimacy with Him. Intimacy with Him. In Matthew 4, 4, it says, But He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God's mouth shows us something. It teaches us that God instructs. God commands, God warns, God calls you, God blesses you, God curses. For instance, when God calls with his mouth, he, the, Jesus said, no man can come to me unless the Father does what? Draw him with what? His hand. What does he do with the hand? He draws. After he did what? He calls. Anthropomorphism. God is invisible. As a matter of fact, it leads to the point of don't sin by making an image. Not on a piece of paper. Not on a portrait. Not in your mind. Because the moment you do, you created an idol because he's not that small. You created a God way, way, way too small if you can come up with an image of him. He says, don't do that. I'm bigger and you'll be blessed for it. Deuteronomy 33 verse 27 says that the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. But here are his arms underneath you, carrying you. You see, the arms of God is also the strength of God. Who can resist the hand of God, the arm of God? You can't. It's the strength of God. So why is this important for us to know that God is spirit and not lose sight of it? Why is it important for us to know this? Because there are many false Christian sects that have arisen believing that God has physical body parts. Mormonism is one. They get this from the fact that Scripture says we are made in His image and His likeness, but they miss the fact that anthropomorphism is in fact a figure of speech, which, by the way, you will learn in hermeneutics, very clearly in first year, is how to know when something is a figure of speech and which one it is, so that you can read the Bible and actually understand what you're reading. For instance, Mormonism missed that, and they built a whole entire sect around this fake idea that they can come up with what God looks like. <clears throat> However, the reason it is important for us to realize that God is spirit is because he is everywhere. He is everywhere. <laughs> the top of heaven, bottom of hell, there he is. He's God. Well, how can he be at two places at the same time? He's spirit. 
That's why. Me asked, Alex, where do you live? <laughs> Hoffman, where are you? Yeah. I asked you where you lived. You're living right here, right now, right? <laughs> you can sit here and think there. You can be at both places. Only your spirit, but not your body. God is everywhere. God is everywhere. And he's everywhere, watch this, in the fullness of all of his attributes. This is so important. God is omnipresent. Omni meaning everywhere. But not just everywhere, but everywhere as God. He is not some places, but he's not God there. This is important. Like, for instance, when he says omnipotent, he is all-powerful. Omni means everywhere to the fullest degree. He is everywhere potent to the nth degree, most potent. In other words, to say that God is omnis uh, omnipresent, he's everywhere, he's omnipotent, he is God everywhere to the fullest degree of who he is. He is never anywhere lacking one attribute. For instance, one attribute is the sovereignty of God. Guess what? He is sovereign in North Korea today because he's omnipresent in all of who he is. He's never not God anywhere. And he's everywhere. God isn't more present in some places and less present in other places. As a matter of fact, he's equally present in a nightclub downtown in New York today than what he is in the underground church on a Sunday morning in China. He's equally present, equally God, equally sovereign to the fullest degree of who he is. Every attribute present. Imagine for a moment, and, and, and I'm saying this because people get, into, people get into weird things. But let me first preface it by this, okay? Imagine if God was sometimes absent, then sometimes present. I feel God here right now. The yeah. end. Then somebody said, well, sometimes he's semi-absent. He's a little bit there. Then mostly present, possibly absent, definitely absent. If this is true, if there was this sliding scale of God being somewhere and not being elsewhere, that would mean he is not an omnipresent God since there are places where he is not present. That breaks that whole other doctrine. No doctrine breaks another doctrine. No doctrine, viol no truth violates another truth. Somebody said the Bible is full of, of contradictions. And, by, and, and the Bible is full of, um, uh, what's the word, you know, they've changed certain words, like 300,000. They've changed 300,000 mistakes or well, alterations is what they say, alterations made to Scripture. Well, the truth of the matter is, there isn't one contradictory truth that you cannot find in Scripture. You cannot find one contradictory truth in Scripture. All right, so let's say, for instance, he's sometimes present, sometimes absent, sometimes semi-absent, and mostly present, and then he's really powerful in certain places and other places he's gone and missing. Well, it would mean, number one, that he's not omnipresent. In other words, he would be absent at certain places. It would mean that he is not necessarily always with you. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. But the Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah, but you went to that nightclub in New York. No, he was there. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He was there. But even to those, he will leave and forsake. He is still there with them, looking at them, because his eyes are everywhere. He's spirit. He's aware of all things, good and evil. If, in fact, God was living on a sliding scale, that would mean that there are certain places and cert uh, certain places and certain times where he is not God. 
Because if he's not there, how can he be God there if he's not there? God has to be all-powerful everywhere, or else he would not be God everywhere. Yet our God is God of the universe. He is everywhere. That's why he is God everywhere in the fullness of who he is. He is supreme. For instance, if God was less present at certain places, then he would be less powerful, less able to save certain people in those places. It simply makes no sense. It simply contradicts all other truths in Scripture to have the idea that, I feel God, God is here right now. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's emotionalism. Or you go to a place and you go like, this is God is absent. No, he's there. He's looking and he's making a list. He actually is. Because there isn't a word we speak that we will not give an account of. Right? God is here. God is here right now. God is here right now in all of his glory. And guess what? He never leaves you and he never forsakes you, no matter where you go. Finally, we have to understand the fact that God is spirit. You see, this is all possible because his spirit cannot be seen, should not be made an image of. Because the moment you do, you misunderstand him. You make him too small. The second thing is important because, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but polytheism and pantheism is making a huge comeback. Pantheism, polytheism, multiple gods, but pantheism, and people are hugging trees. People now, churches are, pe- churches are praying, blessing dogs. I've realized this one thing. Dogs don't need people. People need them. Right? That's why people have dogs. They need that dog. All right? We have a dog. But you have to learn, you have to make sure you realize that don't spiritualize things when they ought not to be spiritualized. For instance, pantheism. Pantheism says that God is in everything. No, Christianity says God is everywhere, but he is not in everything. And the reason... The reason this has become a problem is because I happen to be privileged enough to speak to multiple atheists online, and this becomes a problem for Christianity. Christianity oftentimes is so so thinly educated. Christianity oftentimes has such low understanding of, of certain biblical doctrines that they cannot win the most basics of disagreements and arguments and debates. They, they lose the most basic arguments because... They can't pass, they can't speak past pantheism. Now, pantheism says that God is in everything. God is in the mountain. God is in the tree. God is in the stars. God, God is everywhere. He fills, he fills everything. No, he fills, he is everywhere, but he's not in everything. He's in you. He's in nothing else. This is why atheists, Atheistic scientists, they will use microscopes to look for God and they'll use telescopes to try and find him and they go like, he's, no, he's nowhere, he's not there and he's not there. You see, I can prove to you, he's nowhere. Well, they don't realize that he's spirit. And he's not in the tree, he's not in the mountain, he's not in the star, he's everywhere. And he sits above his creation He's outside of his creation in the sense of me saying, you know, why don't you take your Tesla, open up the engine and find Elon Musk for me? You see, he's not in the creation. He sits outside of it. It only reflects some of the thoughts that went through his mind and the creativity of him. Steve Jobs is not in the Apple computer over there and moving stuff around as you type. Now, the Apple computer is an expression of his thoughts and creative and his ability, but it's not his person. And in the same way, atheists today, they scurrying around this creation here, looking for God under every rock, looking at stars, microscopes, telescopes. Like, you see, God's nowhere. No, he's not in stuff. And his spirit, you will never find him He's outside of his creation. He's holy. 
He's other than his creation. He is not a created being. This is another attribute which we won't cover, but he exists. He's a seer. He means he existed forever and ever, eternity past to eternity future. His love is connected to his aseity, to his eternality. His love has been eternal from eternity past to eternity future. His justice is from eternity past to eternity future. His love for you is from eternity past to eternity future. It's a, it's a profound and con- it's, it's an amazing thing to start looking at who God is and what he is like. And when you have a high view of God, guess what? Your worship can match your understanding of him. Now, he's incomprehensible. But the more you understand of who he is, the higher your worship can soar. If you have no interest in understanding what Scripture speaks of who God is, then your understanding of it, that's your level of worship. Yeah, but I cry when I worship Yahweh. Well, that's all emotional. You cannot worship him beyond what you understand of him to be. You cannot praise him for how great he is if you don't know how great he is. <laughs> you cannot thank him when you don't realize really how good he is, and the doctors of grace will explain that. It's an amazing thing when we start studying God. It changes how you praise, it changes how you worship, it changes how you live. It is the most determining factor in your life is what comes to mind when I say God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for opening our hearts and our minds and our understanding. Lord, that we can take seriously our knowledge of you because this is eternal life that we may know you. Lord, you, you, you told us in Daniel that he that knows you, he who knows he's God, will be confident. He will take action and he will, and he will do mighty exploits. In Jesus' name, amen.